Okay, so good morning, uh, and uh, thank you for joining us, us on this very gloomy Wednesday morning. I don't know if it's gloomy where you are, but we've had rain for, for quite a while now, So, uh, but perfect day to stay inside and watch a Rails Online Roundtable with us. Um, I'm Dan Bostrom, the Rails Member Engagement Manager. Our topic today is Shaping a Library Podcast, and uh, today we're going to hear from Joe Schachter from the Evanston Public Library. Very excited for that. Uh, Joe has taken a very interesting approach. Uh, to uh, library podcasting, and so uh, we're excited to hear about that. Um, just a reminder that our online roundtables are peer-to-peer -peer, uh, events. We consider them to be networking a little bit more than um, you, you know traditional webinar. So Jill's going to talk about uh, Evanston's approach, but we also want to turn this into a conversation. So uh, at the end, there's going to be a time for Q&A, and we're also going to do a facilitated conversation uh, where we ask you questions and you answer questions for us. So uh, we're turning the tables a little bit on you. Uh, we do hope that you'll stick around to participate in that portion. So uh, let's see, uh, this is our agenda for today. Um, we're gonna do a quick introduction and um, I'm gonna talk about some things that are happening around Rails and then uh, we're gonna turn it over to Jill and have her do her presentation. So that will be uh, 15 minutes or so uh, and then we'll do the Q&A and then finally we'll do our text discussion and that will take place in your chat box. Uh, so uh, if you want to practice your chat box, uh, I've put some instructions in there. Uh, you can tell us who you are. Just remember to, uh, to check that all attendees and panelists option in that to field. I'm circ oh, oops, sorry about, sorry about that. I'm circling it right now, right there. So in the to field, there's two options for you as an attendee. There's all panelists, which goes to Jill and I, and all panelists and attendees, uh, which will go to everyone. So if you wanna get your question answered, that's uh, sometimes that's a better thing to do or answer a question. Okay, some Rails uh, news and opportunities that I wanna tell you about. Um, the first thing is uh, I, I want to remind you about a resource that we are constantly updating, and I'm excited about this. So this is our free education page, uh, education resource page. Uh, we're, we're putting together ideas for student learning, and on that page we have a lot of uh, links to popular school library vendors, including Britannica, Gale, MathSpace, and NASA STEM Engagement, and a bunch of others. Uh, so this is something that we're committed to continuing to update, uh, so there, there will be new links on there frequently. So please check back and, uh, and, and, and keep us informed. You can actually comment and let us know if you found other things on that page, uh, and we would definitely appreciate that. E-Read Illinois. So speaking of online learning, uh, we've just announced that anyone that has the E-Read Illinois Access 360 app can now check out a collection of 4,000 simultaneous use ebooks. So that means no holds and no waits. Uh, and we are keeping these books open uh, through June. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, I don't know if, if that will continue beyond June, but, uh, but we'll see about that. Uh, and that 4,000, that collection of 4,000 books is in addition to the 46 6,000 titles that we have available through um, Access 360. So if your library is currently not participating um, or subscribing to Access 360, uh, that is available to you. Uh, just get in touch with us. Um, you can go to eReadIllinois.com and, uh, and learn more. I uh, want to tell you about a webinar that we have coming up, and this is coming up in two weeks. Uh, this will be a lot of fun. Two library directors will talk about a very important topic, uh, failure. Uh, so you'll hear uh, from those two library directors about how they failed and, uh, and then how they've learned about it and how they learned from that situation. So that is Wednesday, May 13th at 2 p.m. Uh, and you can sign up via L2. Uh, this is something I wanted to tell you about that happened in the past, but it's, uh, it was a very well attended uh, webinar and it's available from the Rails website. Uh, so we were really lucky to have uh, Stephanie Garofalo from the Northeast Document Conservation Center come to talk, of, talk to us. Uh, and she presented on basic practices for handling and uh, surface cleaning of your collections. Uh, she also talked about ways to mitigate risks to collections and to staff. Uh, again, this was really well attended, so we wanted to make sure all of you are aware of it. It is available to watch at any time, uh, as long as you are logging in uh, with your L2 username uh, to the Rails website. 
Okay, last thing I want to mention is we have two upcoming roundtables. Uh, we actually have one on Monday that we're excited about. Uh, we have a presentation from a team of folks at the Gail Borden Public Library, and they're going to talk about sort of a holistic view to virtual programs. They put together a whole schedule. Uh, they talked about how to implement this on a team level. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that. And they're also going to uh, cover some um, how to assess uh, success and, uh, you know, what, um, what progress looks like. Um, and then in about uh, three weeks, we have Emily Glimco from, actually two weeks, we have Emily Glimco from the Addison Public Library, and she's going to be doing a presentation on solo library marketing. Uh, so uh, if you're one person marketing team, or if you know someone at your library who, uh, that's, one of, uh, that's one of the responsibilities, uh, you won't want to miss it. I think it'll be a really uh, upbeat and positive presentation. Um, okay, so so that is all the news and Rails uh, opportunities that I wanted to tell you about. So at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Jill. Jill, are you there? I am here. Do you hear me? I do. Yeah, sounds good. Excellent. I was getting a couple of notifications that I have an unstable internet connection. So hopefully, if I disappear for a moment, I shall return. Okay, you sound you sound great right now. So we're good. Great. Well, it's great to be here. And thank you, Dan, for putting this together. Uh, the library started our podcast called The Checkout in January of 2020. So far, we put out seven episodes and we've had 1,300 um, streams of the um, seven episodes. Uh, so the question was, we started thinking about doing a podcast back in uh, last summer. And the question was really, should we even do a podcast? We have a pretty uh, thin budget at Evanston Public Library. We do not have a deep uh, layers of staff. And so would it be worth our time to even do a podcast? And I've been thinking, I've been watching my kids who are in their 20s listening to podcasts for maybe the last two or even maybe at least a couple of years. And then I noticed that in the past year, I had started making podcasts a more regular part of my diet. And I thought, well, I'm 58 years old. If I'm listening now to podcasts on a regular basis, surely it has reached some kind of critical mass. And then the Pew Research uh, for 2019 came out on podcasts. And uh, it turned out to really be true that podcasts have reached a kind of critical mass. 70% of Americans have heard of podcasts. This is up from 64% in 2018, and it represents 197 million Americans. Uh, and in just the past 12 months, approximately 20 million Americans discovered what a podcast is. 51% uh, of Americans have listened to a podcast, 12 or older. Nearly a quarter of Americans listen to podcasts weekly, and 40% of Americans, 54 or younger, listen to podcasts monthly. So. I think we've decided, well, podcasts have become mainstream enough to warrant attention from the library. And not just in creating a podcast from the library, but also we could educate the public on how to listen to a podcast. Because I realized just in talking to people, a lot of people, I, I ended up showing people, oh yeah, look, there's this app, it's on your phone, here's what it looks like. A lot of people are carrying around a phone and they don't know that there's an app right on it that you know opens up this huge world of information to them so then the question became what kind of podcast to do and i did a little bit of research and i looked around and it seemed that a lot of library podcasts um, were about books well i personally i'm not a librarian um and i'm the one who, who does the podcast and uh we chose to veer away from that topic for our first venture into the podcast world. Evanston is a very diverse community. We have a lot of people in the community who are very, read very widely, and they have a lot of places, people, and publications they can turn to for book reviews. Um, and others in the community would have very little interest in a podcast focused on books. We have a lot of people who use our library, and they're not using it for books at all. They're using it for all kinds of different reasons. So then the question became, okay, what would appeal to the Evanston community? And one thing that binds a, a lot of Evan, Evanston residents together is this really deep love for Evanston. There are a lot of people here who will say that there is no other place they could picture themselves living. This is a very common thing you'll hear of 
Evanstonians across all the whole diverse spectrum. Uh, so we decided that we would do our podcast interviewing the people of Evanston who live and work here and who do some cool things that make our community better. And in that way, we would be introducing our residents to some of the most important resources of all in our community, and that's our people. Uh, Evanston has um, a real, Evanston Public Library has a great relationship with our community organizations. Uh, we have more than uh, over 175 active partnerships with community organizations. So we're very tuned into our community. And in a way, we're sort of uniquely positioned to introduce residents to the amazing people of Evanston. And who knows what kind of connections will happen after somebody, you know, is introduced to people who are here. And so the Checkout podcast was born. Um, books aren't the only thing we can tell you about. We can tell you about who we are as a community. And this is a way to engage the Evanston community and to give people a voice. Um, the other thing we always make sure to do in every episode pretty much is to tie in the role the library plays in the community. So we don't leave the library out. We'll always have some side note with the guest on something related to the library. And so the checkout was born. Uh, so who to interview for the checkout? Um, you know, it would be very easy to just go to all my friends and say, do you want to be on the checkout? But the answer is that we wanted to um, interview as diverse an array of people who live and work in Evanston uh, as possible. Uh, we have really increased our focus in Evanston and Evanston Public Library on equity, diversity, and inclusion over the past two years. And we're looking at all we do through an equity lens. So we know that it is really important that our guests on the podcast should represent the diverse makeup of our community. So our first guest was not chosen randomly. We interviewed uh, Patricia Effiam, who is both an African-American pastor in Evanston, and she, uh, she is no longer, but she was at that time the city's first chief equity officer. Uh, other guests have included um, a photographer who embarked on a project to photograph Evanston's um, homeless population where they sleep. Uh, a community development expert who taught Evanston students, Evanston Township High School students, how to get involved in their community through volunteerism. Um, Dino Robinson, who started an archive of North Shore African American history, and an arts advocate who's galvanized the Evanston arts community and encouraged people to buy Evanston art. Um, I'm going to give a try at recording a podcast via Zoom next week, and I'm planning to interview a historian who is documenting the pandemic for Evanston. Uh, so if you want to do an interview style podcast, uh, my recommendations are to reach out very broadly for guest recommendations uh, and keep a running list, keep a good list. Make sure to include underrepresented and minority voices, not just the usual suspects. Ask leaders in your community for recommendations, but don't just focus on high level leaders as your guests. Um, you don't want to just end up with a bunch of talking points. Um, ask people why they're recommending someone and keep some really good notes on your list. Ask your entire library staff for recommendations. Um, ask your podcast guests for their recommendations and then ask them again. Um, they're a great source and can lead you to people you might not know about otherwise. Uh, I think you can explore the sort of full range of human endeavor, the arts, government, medicine, academia, education, the library world, not-for-profits, inspirational stories in your community, business. Um, there, there are a lot of, lot of topics and the library is a great, a great place to be exploring the world from through the lens of people. Um, and then, you know, I would just write to people or call potential guests, tell them about what we were trying to do to gauge their interest and let them know what we're trying to achieve through the podcast. So then how you prepare for and conduct the interview. So I do a lot of research. I look for news articles, blogs, website information. I ask other people, what do you know about this person? Tell me what you know about them. Why do you think they'd be a good guest? 
You can get, find out a lot of things that will later lead to good interview questions. Um, I got a lot of inspiration from listening to other podcasts. You listen to a lot and you decide um, what you do and do not like about them. Uh, so if you're going to do an interview podcast, what kind of interviewer do you want to be? Uh, for example, a few of the podcasts I've listened to, uh, are, there's a podcast, Armchair Expert, Dax Shepard is the host of that. He talks a lot about himself. Now, of course, he's a, he's a TV star. He talks a lot about himself, and then he asks questions of his guests. Well, I didn't want to talk a lot about myself. Um, Alec Baldwin does, a, does an interview podcast called Here's the Thing, and he asks a lot of questions, and he asks them quickly, and there was something about that I kind of liked. He really, I thought that was interesting. And then, of course, there's the sort of queen of interviewing, Terry Gross, and, uh, you know, I just think she's a really masterful and sensitive interviewer. I'm sure she's unbelievably well prepared. And there are a few a podcasts that interview Terry Gross about interviewing that I think are, are required listening for anybody who wants to do an interview podcast. Um, there's one on the long form podcast that interviews Terry. Mark Marin interviews Terry. Uh, you can get a lot of great tips on interviewing. Uh, conduct a pre-interview if you can. I mean, this is time consuming, but it's really worth it to get together with your guest for a casual conversation before you actually record. You can tell them what you're thinking about talking about with them and see what they say and ask them if there's anything else they might want to talk about. You should always just take really great notes, ask them what's on their mind currently, and then get some basics out of the way so you can have an accurate intro prepared, you know, their current title and a brief description of who this person is and how they would describe themselves. Um, I create a list of questions for recording day and I have a loose understanding of the direction I'd like the conversation to go, but I also wanna be flexible and prepare to go with the flow. It's nice to have a good handle on your questions because it's really nice to keep eye to eye contact while you're talking to someone. So looking down a lot, I don't know, it kind of can interrupt the flow. Um, as an aside, Terry Gross records most of her interviews over the phone and uh, so she can just look at her notes because she's not looking into the eyes of anybody. She's doing it from her studio and it's just through audio. Uh, then you have to decide where you're gonna record. Um, I record in my office. Uh, so there's the, uh, if you know the NPR Tiny Desk Concerts, this is like a Tiny Desk podcast. It's very casual uh, and relaxed. Um, give instructions to prepare and relax the guests. One of the great things about doing a podcast is audio is such a forgiving medium. You can stop recording at any time. You can start back up again. Sometimes it's kind of intense to keep going and asking questions and I'll just say, oh, let's just take a, let's just take a break here. And I'll tell the person, if you don't like the way you said something, we can start again. Just take the pressure off and remind them that this is a very low stakes endeavor. Um, and then ask your guest at the end of the session, after you're all done, who else do you think we should interview? Why do you think so? And then write to your guest before the episode airs, tell them it's gonna air, ask them to um, share it through their networks. And then once your podcast is recorded, um, now what? So, you know, how often do you want to post a podcast? I mean, a lot of this is going to depend on the kind of resources you have. As I say, we're a very thinly uh, structured organization. We have a newsletter, an e-newsletter that goes out every two weeks to about 36,000 people. So we decided we'd put out a podcast every two weeks, but I got seven in the can before I even started putting them out because I never wanted to be in the position where I had to record and prepare a podcast every two weeks because I just really might not be able to accomplish that. So I had a few recorded ahead of time. Uh, and then we promote it on our social media, on our own channels and other people's channels. Uh, now with the pandemic, you know, I'm sort of looser on myself and I don't really require that it comes out every two weeks, but um, so uh, what else can I say? Um, we use freelance help for recording and editing. We have no equipment of our own at Evanston Public Library. So I do not, um, 
uh, an audio person comes and sits with me and then um, edits it and returns it to me. Uh, we host our podcast on Libsyn, which is considered one of the best places to do so. It's been very easy and completely glitch free and they, you can get some nice stats without having to pay a lot of money per month. Um, well, doing the checkout podcast for me has certainly been um, the most fun and stimulating part of my job. I really enjoy doing it. It's really fun and I feel like it's a really effective way to engage our community. Okay, thank you, Jill. I appreciate that. Uh, awesome. That, that's a, a great sort of intro. Um, at this point, uh, I am going to ask if anybody has any questions for Jill, uh, you can put them in the chat box and we will uh, answer them. Um, I, I have a question for you, Jill, as, as people are typing and getting uh, sort of prepared is, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm interested in that pre-interview. Um, how, how long is it typically is the pre-interview? Um, you know, what, what do you go over with them? Uh, you know, like what are the fundamentals to that? Yeah, the way that I did it in the, uh, the before times, the pre-pandemic times, I would just really ask someone if they would be willing to come meet me at a coffee shop. And uh, we would sit down and maybe uh, spend 45 minutes to an hour, really just part of it is literally to get to know one another as, as human beings and not even really think about the podcast, like, how are you doing? How's life? What's going on? You know, just so that you can start to develop a bit of a relationship with the person. Um, and then, you know, I have my notebook with me and then I tell, I, I go prepare to prepare to tell them some of the things I think we could discuss. And then I say, what do you think about that? Is there anything else you think we could discuss? And then ask again, is there anything else you think um, we could discuss? And I just take really good notes. I mean, it's pretty simple. It's about developing a little bit of a human connection seeing if you're on the right track and adjusting accordingly if they have some different ideas than you might have from whatever research you've done. Yeah, I like that. So it's it's creating a relationship, but it's kind of being persistent about it a little bit. You, you know, the I like the idea of uh, this might seem this might seem simple, but I think it's hugely effective is asking is repeating that question, you know, wh what else do you think we can talk about? Um, because I think people, uh, a lot of people are naturally um, humble or, 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 or feel, uh, you know, like this isn't, in, I, like, oh, this isn't going to be in, 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 uh, interesting to other people or something like that. But, but in reality, it is very interesting to other people. And, um, and I, and I, I love that you've sort of invoked Terry Gross, because I think she's great about bringing out people. Uh, and, and it's funny that you mentioned that Mark Marin interview with Terry Gross. I listened to that. And Mark Marin does a wonderful job of bringing out Terry Gross, because Terry Gross is sort of a, a like, very private person. Um, but, but it's, it's a lot of fun. He sort of turns the tables on her a little bit. Yeah, the other thing I just want to add is that, um, in the pre-interview, definitely have a couple of things that you want to talk to them about that you're excited about. I mean, obviously there's a reason that you've tapped this person. Let them see like you're, you're for them, you know, you're really interested, you know, in, in what they're doing. And it's amazing how when you show someone your interest and, and, and probe a little bit, you know, people really appreciate that. We're talking about their life's work and it is important to people, obviously, the things they do. So if you show that you care about that, I think it really goes a long way. Yeah, and that, that is something, you know, libraries are great at is just like demonstrating that sort of curiosity about other people and, um, you know, subjects and processes and programs and things like that. So uh, yeah, that's a great point. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, just, just a reminder, you can put your questions in the chat box. We have one here from Noel. Uh, Jill, how long do you plan for each podcast in terms of actual like playing time? Is that question, how long will the podcast be? I think, so, so I would, uh, yeah, okay, yep, I think, I think, well, actually, I'm, I'm interested in both the sides of this question, like, how, how much preparation do you put into each podcast, and then, um, and then how much does that translate into, like, an actual recording time? Yeah, that's sort of a tough question to answer. Um, 
our podcasts are about, um, I would, I, I definitely try to keep them under 40 minutes. So most of them I've been in like the 30 minute range. You know, how long does it, you know, probably takes, it, it's pretty hard to say, you know, I spend, because I do it sort of sporadically around doing other things. I will say this, that to do seven episodes, we started thinking about the podcast last summer and started recording them in September and then launched in January. I know that's not that helpful, you know, with exactly how much time it takes to prepare for one podcast. But, you know, if you figure there's some time researching, you know, who's your, who your guest is going to be, might be from your big long list that hopefully you're putting together. And then there's some research and, you know, I've used work study students for this. We get to have Northwestern work study students at Evanston and that can be helpful. Um, you know, they will do some background research, see if they can find anything out there on this person. Um, you know, there's preparing the interview, preparing the questions. The, you know, some, some of the stuff is like just even scheduling the podcast, getting everybody's schedule. For me, that's my schedule, the person we're interviewing and having an audio person in the room. Sometimes it can take a little while to, to get all the schedules aligned. That can be a little bit of a time consuming part. Um, but I would say for each one podcast, you know, it doesn't take a ton of time. I sort of do it scattered among a lot of other things. So it's kind of hard for me to say exactly, but maybe that gives you some idea. Yeah, definitely. And, and would you, so how much starting and stopping would you say that you do? Uh, so, you know, like in a typical podcast that you want to be 40 minutes, um, are you say, I, would you say that you're spending uh, like an hour, an hour and a half, just like actually recording it um, and then sort of editing it down to, to like, uh, to that 40 minutes? Yes, I'd say, I'd say that that's right. Okay. Um, we, we don't want to, um, because we're not resource rich, we definitely do not want to have a lot of editing that needs to be done. So that's why I do try to plan a pretty good track of what the questions will be, allowing for some flexibility, because I, I, I don't want to have to have it edited very much. But I do like stopping in the middle, because it can get intense, you know, like, just like looking at a person's eyes and listening. It's, it's amazing how much energy it can take to be a really good listener and to also keep track of where you want to go next without just being in your own head, thinking about your question as opposed to what this person is saying to you. Yeah, great point. Yeah, I like that. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, next question we have is um, Donna, uh, sorry, Donna asks, um, I would love to, I know she says, I know nothing about creating a podcast, but would love to learn. Please explain more about the hosting. Uh, how much does it cost, et cetera? Yeah, so um, on Libsyn it is what we use, L-I-B-S-Y-N. I'm trying to remember how much we are paying per month to have our podcast hosted on Libsyn. There are different um, degrees. We do not use the cheapest, but we do not use the most expensive. It is, I think it's, I think it's about $20 a month. I could be wrong. It might be 40, but I don't think it's any more than that. And, uh, you know, after the podcast is all recorded, um, you know, you just upload it to Libsyn. It's actually very easy. I mean, I'm 58. I am not like terrible at technology, but I'm also not great at it. And I do not find it difficult to do. You know, another thing I, I did not mention is you have to have show notes. So that's another thing that gets loaded into Libsyn. I don't know if, if you fall, read, if you are listening to podcasts yourself, they will have show notes. Um, so I keep a Google Doc with all the show notes um, that I create after the recording's been done. Um, and that's like a rough, that's sort of like a rough description of like what happens when in the podcast. Yeah, it's a, I do definitely do not do it timed. Like this is what happens at this time. Some okay. people do. It's like a paragraph of, uh, you know, in this episode of the checkout, we talked to so-and-so. She told us X, Y, Z, you know, just like a paragraph. Yeah. Um, I also had um, one of my audio guys, you know, often audio people are often musicians, and this is why they have the equipment. I mean, sometimes. So uh, Steve Johnson, who is working with me, he works with me also as a communications consultant for the library. He composed original music for the podcast. So that was nice. Um, yeah. and 
And actually, can you, there's another question here from Barb uh, that's kind of in the same vein. Can you talk a little bit more about um, sort of like the editing, the uh, audio editor? You said this guy is a freelancer um, from outside the library. And, you know, is there, is there a cost, like, do you know what, what the approximate cost would be for that type of thing? I think there's really a, a range of cost. So I have two people that will do, that can perform this function for me. One is a library sub also. He used to work at Evanston. Now he works at Chicago Public Library, but he's still an Evanston Public Library sub. And so um, he gets paid his rate for subbing for the library that he does for editing the podcast. The other guy who's a consultant for us, we have a contract with him to just do work for us every month. So, it, so in my case, you know, I have these sort of unique circumstances. And the guy who used to work at the library, he also started a podcast network called the Now Playing Network. So I was just got really lucky. When I, when I let the library know we were starting a podcast and said, if anybody has any ideas, I sent out a library all message to people. You know, Jim raised his hand and was like, I'll help. And little did I know this guy was, he has several of his own podcasts. So I got very lucky. But I'd say when you put out your net wide, you never know who's going to come in there and help you. Uh, and as for you know, on the market, how much an audio editor would cost, you know, a typical freelance audio editor. I, I actually don't know because I was not put in that position. Yeah. And, and, but I, I think it's a, but I think that's a good point about uh, just, you know, uh, reaching out to your network and especially internal in the library is, uh, you know, the, the library is such a great place for people that are familiar with like the art scene and, um, and might be artists in their free time or have extra hobbies or things like that. Um, especially musicians as well. Um, I, I think that you'll be surprised sometimes about who knows about podcasts, who knows about like sound editing and things like that. Um, you know, and there, there, are, there are free tools out there um, that that I do know that that you that people can use. Um, Audacity is one uh, is is a, a sound editing tool that I, I've used before with other um, with other ventures that sort of thing. So um, yeah, it, it, you know, some I think some libraries will might have to go down the route of hiring, um, uh, you know, like a freelancer or something like that. But um, but like you said, sometimes uh, the, you know you get lucky when you find out the people that are. Uh, talented enough to, to have those things uh, in their back pocket. Yeah, and I think that a lot of people are doing podcasts now. I, I have a feeling it's really not that hard to find some people to help because people really want to get into this technology now. And it's, it's actually for people who have any recording skills, this, it's not difficult. I mean, it would be difficult for me and I don't want to edit my own podcast, but I think there are a lot of people for whom they would love to help with this. And uh, you just have to kind of cast your net. And um, I think you'll find the people that you need. Yeah. Uh, OK, so this is great. Meredith has a question for you, Jill. Um, and this is actually something that I wanted to kind of touch on a little bit, too, is she says, will you continue recording podcasts remotely? And th the answer is yes, It's because uh, I, I know you mentioned doing it over Zoom, but maybe you could tell me a little bit about that. I know you haven't actually done it yet, but what are you expecting? What are you, uh, what, what are you uh, hoping will happen? Yeah, I'm really excited about this, actually, um, because in a way, I am actually a little bit tech phobic, and I kind of always have been. Even when I was in college, I went to a journalism school at Northwestern, and I did work at the college radio station, and I did the news for them, and I did theater reviews for them, and I really wanted to have my own show, but I was just really afraid to use the technology in the studio. I mean, this is even back when I was in my, you know, teens and 20s. Um, so I decided, you know what, you can do this, Jill, and I am going to be recording my first podcast next week on Zoom. I did a pre-interview this week. I sent the recording to my, it was very easy. I sent the recording to my audio engineer. I said, does this sound okay? Is this going to make a decent podcast? And I really love the person I'm going to interview. The Evanston History Center is, uh, working on a project to document the pandemic for Evanston. So they really want people to send in pictures and videos and reflect written reflections because this is major history in the making. And so there's a historian at the Evanston History Center who is in charge of this project. And I just find it fascinating. Like I have loved looking at all the signs on the stores and then the signs changed every time new news came out. I mean, that was just the very beginning for me. It was like, wow, these signs are so fascinating. People closing their store, or 
So yeah, I'm going to be recording that on Monday. It's really not hard to do. And I just have to say that if I can do this stuff, anybody can, because I am, you know, I'm not terrible, but I'm not great. And uh, it is not hard to record remotely through Zoom at all. Great. That's a very uplifting message. I love that. Uh, <laughs> and, and yeah, I, I, one thing I also want to note is, you know, yeah, just, just totally right about Zoom. Um, Zoom will actually, if you are doing uh, like a meeting or uh, like a webinar like we're doing today on Zoom, um, uh, you can actually record an MP. It's just you record an MP. Is it MP4? I think I think that's right. Yeah, you record an MP4 version, and uh, you can you could use easily like rec again you could at least easily easily edit it with a free uh, free software with something like uh, like I mentioned Audacity before. So we could actually turn this into a podcast if we wanted to. The the only the only um, re restriction we would have is like the hosting of it, and as Jill mentioned, that's kind of the the second part about it is you need to find a place to host it. Oh, and people, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Donna. I appreciate that. Don, Donna, uh, uh, um, Donna corrected me. MP4 is video. MP3 is audio. And that is correct. Yeah, thank you, Donna. Um, and, and it would just be, you know, just be pure audio and you'd be able to, um, you know, if you had a hosting place, you'd be able to drop that, uh, that MP3 audio format into, um, into your hosting site. And then, um, a lot of places you just hit publish on it and it sends it to things like Apple podcasts or, um, you know, uh, other, other places, Spotify, I think, um, and, uh, and wherever else podcasts are, uh, Google play, I believe, um, and that's, you know, you'd be able to publish it straight there. Um, so, so that, that is a cool option. And, uh, and I think that may actually open it up to a lot more libraries that want to do things. Um, you know, Jill did a great job of sort of pointing out the ways or how, how much podcasting has grown and how much, uh, you know, how audiences have really developed. So um, that, that is, uh, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so questions, any, any other questions for Jill, please feel free to put them into the po uh, into the chat box. I almost said podcast. In the meantime, uh, we're going to move into our text discussion. We have uh, about uh, 20 minutes left here. So uh, we want to hear from you. Um, so I'm going to put in the first question. And the first question is pretty easy. Does your library have a podcast? Um, or are you thinking about starting one? Um, and uh, so tell us what you are doing, what you would like to do. Uh, and that will be a good way to start. Hold on. All right about starting one. Uh, in the meantime, while you are typing, uh, Jill, I had another question for you. Um, okay, so, uh, uh, all right, so let's see here. Oh, okay, this is kind of about your influences. And I liked how you talked about this is uh, sort of identifying yourself um, as an interviewer. Um, when, when you're thinking about this, uh, you know, like, tell me, tell me a little bit more about how you've developed your style. Like what, you know, what did you, what did you decide in terms of like letting the conversation flow and, um, and how, how would you, how would you sort of characterize yourself as an interviewer? Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, first of all, I do have a background in this. In my previous, I am not a librarian. In my previous, um, I went to journalism school, and then I worked in publishing, and I actually worked for an audio publisher, and I did interview authors as a part of um, my audio publishing career, and some of them were very well-known um, authors. So I've been at this for a while, but I hadn't been doing it for a long time, so this is a bit of a return for me to a medium I really love. You know, I just characterize myself as someone who is an enthusiastic proponent of interesting people. And I have a true genuine enthusiasm in hearing who these people are, what they have to offer, what other people in the community might want to know about them, what would benefit the most people in our community from hearing, um, what these people have to say. I like to imagine that people will hear things and, and if, if there's a reason for them to connect with this person that maybe they will. So I, I think that I also inject a little bit of humor. I like to inject a little bit of humor into it. I feel like I laugh 
quite a bit during the podcast. I mean, if there's something to laugh to laugh about, I suppose when somebody's talking about Evanston's homeless and where they're sleeping and photographing them, there's not a lot to laugh about there. But um, I, I try not to talk too much myself, but I will inject a story once in a while of, of my own that might relate to what they're talking about. I'll definitely inject something about the library but I, I guess enthusiastic listening is how I would perhaps describe myself. That's an awesome term, enthusiastic listening. I love it. Uh, that could also be a really good band name. Um, uh, that, that is, <laughs> that is I, well, I think uh, that's one thing that I really loved about listening to your podcast is I think it was, mu- it, it was very much a conversation where it felt like you were, you were building a relationship as the, converse, as the conversation was progressing. Um, and, and, and one thing I'll say just in, in regards to that is that is one way to go about this. Uh, you know, Jill's, Jill, the, the Checkout Podcast is one way um, to folks out there who are attending and participating, um, you know, you might want to go about it completely differently and that's totally fine. Um, it might fit your community better. Um, so, so, uh, just keep that in mind. Um, okay. I want to get some to some of these responses to the first question. Again, the question was, does your library have a podcast? Are you thinking about starting one? Um, some folks say no, um, they don't have one, but they've been thinking about it. Uh, curious about how difficult it would be. Yeah. I, 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 Aaron, that's a, um, it's a good, uh, that's a good point. Uh, I, I, I think we've sort of noted here that it's not that difficult. It will probably take some investment in terms of money and time, um, but I think it's uh, but I think it's a really fun thing to offer. Uh, Noel says we do not have pa- do not have a podcast, but we do have a digital media studio. So I thought it'd be a good addition to our services. Yeah, awesome. That would be great. Uh, Jennifer says we do not have a podcast, but I've been waiting to start a readers theater, theater radio theater type of program. Some of my friends uh, floated the idea of doing performances as podcasts, so I'm happy to see, hoping to see if I'm, that might be possible. I have zero personal experience with podcasts, but some other with radio theater performances. Oh, that's awesome, Jennifer. Jennifer, I appreciate you uh, participating and and uh, and and put and posting that. That's a really cool idea. Uh, I've never come across that before, but uh, but radio theater sounds like a lot of fun. You're, please tell us, please tell us more about that, Jennifer. We'd like to um, explore that here. Um, okay, so keep keep those question two uh, responses coming. Let us know if you uh, have a podcast or you're thinking about um, putting one together. Um, okay, so so not a lot of it sounds like not a lot of folks out there have podcasts, um, but. Uh, you know, maybe you can tell us about what you would like to hear. So, uh, you know, if you've thought about it, uh, question two is, if you've, uh, if you've thought about starting a podcast, what kind of podcast would you do? Uh, who would you interview and, uh, or what would you talk about? Starting a podcast. Sorry, I'm typing this as I talk. Uh, uh, what? look like who would you who would you not how who would you interview what would you talk about um okay and um jill kind of going back to this conversation about um i i and I, that's one thing i'm i'm super excited about is uh you're you, like interviewing authors and things like that were you ever intimidated to to like interview authors or were you ever intimidated to author to to interview people um you know like for for the checkout was that ever in the kind of like a factor in in how, in how you did things uh, I would say that I was even intimidated to come here today. So, you know, I am always, <laughs> it always makes me nervous. You know, I'm always nervous when I do these things, but now I am just used to the fact after a lot of years that, you know, that nervousness is because I'm, I care and I'm excited. So yes, I, I actually am not the type of person, I am not intimidated by anybody's um, stature or who they are, or it's, that's not where the intimidation comes from. I, I just, this stuff just makes me really nervous. Um, but I think it's just maybe the way I get when I'm most really uh, excited about something. So don't let intimidation uh, stop you, I, <laughs> you know, yeah. 
Well, it, it, well, it's certainly nice to have had that background of talking to authors and things like that. And again, talk about interesting people to, to interview. Um, I could see those conversations ranging very far and wide, um, as I'm sure they have, you know, very interesting backgrounds, probably um, a wide variety of backgrounds. Uh, so that could definitely be somewhere to sort of take a take an interview. Um, Okay, Donna says, we have a monthly local author series where we highlight local authors, so I would definitely interview them. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, thank you, Donna. Also, just doing a library update about what, what is going on, et cetera. Yeah, actually, Jill, would you talk a little bit more about that, about the, the tie-in, the like library tie-in, and maybe you can give some sort of examples about how you've done that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so when our first guest, as I said, was Pat Effiem, who is the uh, city of Evanston's uh, first chief equity officer. And so it was a natural that when I was talking to her, I brought in the library's own equity work. We did an equity uh, diversity and inclusion assessment that was published in 2018. So that was a great time to mention that. When I interviewed Doug Haight, who has been photographing Evanston's homeless population where they sleep, we definitely talked about how the library is a place where homeless people um, are welcome, where they gather. We now have a full-time social worker at Evanston Public Library, so we are even providing services um, to uh, homeless, so I brought that up. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples. Um, you know, when I interviewed Lisa Degley and Tony, who is an arts advocate in Evanston, it was a time to bring up the fact that, um, you know, we have local art at EPL exhibits. So that it, it's almost like you can tie anything into the library, literally anything. You just have to think about what, what you, I mean, since a library does so much, um, I think almost anything could be tied back to the library, even if it's just the mention of a book or, you know, there's a lot of ways to tie back to a library. Yeah, good point. And, and this is a good chance for, for me to mention that uh, Rails has a podcast as well. It's called Sparks. Our executive director, Deirdre Brennan, interviews librarians, uh, people in the publishing industry, uh, people adjacent to libraries, uh, you know, teachers, um, people that are passionate about literacy and access services and everything like that. So um, that that is a uh, uh, and and as Jill mentioned, you can tie a lot back to the library. So uh, sometimes it, it goes. We, one time she interviewed uh, someone that that does like marketing, um, and, and found a way to kind of talk about how uh, you know libraries can do marketing and 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 ways in which they can sort of tie in uh, marketing into what they do. So uh, yeah, good point. Um, okay, uh, back to the uh, responses. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Donna says, uh, or sorry, Aaron says, I would imagine our podcast, if we had one, would be materials oriented. Our staff is very passionate about their reading, viewing, etc. Our town is on the smaller side, so I'm afraid we would run out of people to interview pretty quickly. Thank you, Aaron. That's that's good. Um, Noel says, I have thought that we would want to keep it local interest. So I thought of local history or authors, but I really like how Jill has expanded the local idea. Yeah, thanks, Noel. That's awesome. Uh, Jennifer, okay, Jennifer, I love, okay, Jennifer's responding to the old time radio program, but I'm going to, I'm going to get back to that because uh, I want to get to a couple other responses here. Uh, Aaron says, although our patrons love history programs, Washington has a pretty interesting history. So that would be a thought. Yeah, that's good. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Okay, so Jennifer's response says, uh, so the radio program, it's like an old time radio program, but generally recorded live. It's gonna requ require a folly person's uh, people for sound effects. My brothers and dad used to be involved in a group that did the performances live. Basically all of the quote unquote actors stand in front of microphones in their everyday clothes and they read the script with feeling. When they do things that require sounds, the, the sound crew creates those sounds for example, falling down, smacking a series, smacking a piece of raw meat with a fist when someone is punched, walking with shoes in a pan of kitty litter on a piece of wood for footsteps, oh man, <laughs> and dumping out a bag of all kinds of odds and ends with a lady's purse is being emptied out and searched. If you want to hear what it sounds like, check out any recording on archive.org. <laughs> Jennifer, that sounds amazing. Uh, she also says, listening to, pod listening to this podcast, uh, I'm thinking that local history stories would be something interesting. We have a small section in, uh, on that in the monthly newsletter, and I consistently have people telling me what they really look forward to that section every month. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. That's really cool. I appreciate that. 
Um, okay, so um, thank you all for responding. Our third question, and it looks like we have about 10 minutes left, is uh, so what about the technology? Um, have you examined the technology needed for podcasts? How would you record your sessions? Uh, how would you get them edited? Uh, and posting it now. Um, and uh, Jill, I want to go back to a question um, a little bit about kind of the the promotion of the podcast. You, you mentioned that you you put those um, you put those into the uh, email e newsletter that you do. Um, how, how what are other ways that you promote your podcast um, to, to patrons? Yeah, uh, so it goes in our newsletter, um, and if I put a, a, a podcast in the newsletter once, there's no saying I can't go put it back in again or put it back in in a different way. Like maybe in one newsletter, it'll be like, oh, Betsy Bird was just on the podcast and there it is in the newsletter. But maybe the next week it'll be like, have you, are you into podcasts yet? Did you know so many percentage of people listen to a podcast? Here's who's on our podcast. And then I might list all the people we have with a link to the podcast. So one good, great place is our newsletter because we do have such a big list. But then there's, you know, there's Facebook, there's Twitter, there are other, you know, Evanston has a lot of like, you know, school district uh, Facebook pages and, you know, Evanston community of mothers Facebook pages. But the other thing is, is that some guests will promote it themselves. Not all, not everybody's a great self promoter, but some people, you know, like Lisa Degley and Tony, who, who helps to uh, promote Evanston artists. I mean, she's just an unbelievable promotion machine. So of course, when her podcast came out, you know, she just, you know, promoted it like crazy. So you can also hopefully depend on your guests to do some promotion for you and you should not be shy to encourage them to do so. And, and how do you, how do you measure success or how, how do you, uh, even anecdotally, how, how have you sort of, um, what has the response been like? How, how have you been sort of gauging how, how things are going so far? Yeah, well, I would say like the first four podcasts at about 250 um, streams each, which I think is really great. Because if you think about how many people would come to a program and you'd feel good about it, you know, I don't really look at it any differently than that. I would say that the last two podcasts we've put out, which has been since the pandemic, amazing how the like listenership just dropped to, you know, a hundred for one and 75 for the most recent one. So that, I don't know what that tells me. It's just like people are just scattered and they're all over the place. And um, so hopefully that will, you know, come back up. Maybe with the next one being about the pandemic itself, you know, I'm going to see uh, you know, I've had a few people, you know, tell me that it's, you know, they think it's fantastic, but you know, uh, other than that, I mean, it's a good question. I think the numbers are good. So yeah. listen, if you had like 20 people listening, you know, maybe I'd say, okay, this isn't, this isn't really worth it. You know, one other thing I wanted to say, which is not really on the topic of your question, but I just don't want to leave it out. Yeah, go ahead. I think that a, a good, a cool thing about a podcast is, and maybe really a lot of things in life. Um, you know, it can change over time. It can change over time. Like now that um, so much is going to change, I think, in our library post when we start going back to business, it probably will not be business as usual. And, you know, I just think that maybe the subject, the content might change or I, I don't know, like it can change. The way the checkout sounds right now like maybe it'll change over time. I think you just have to be kind of open and flexible. You know, it's not like people are really depending on it to sound a certain way or, you know, we can, we can make adjustments. You can make adjustments, you can get going and then you can shift a bit, you know? I think, yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think we, <laughs> right now we're all very used to shifting and changing because uh, <laughs> cause it seems like it happens pretty regularly. Um, and, and also I want to say, going back to the point about, um, you know, the, the numbers uh, dropping a little bit, um, you know, Kelly uh, had a comment, stats might drop if people are not commuting to work. Of course, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I listen to podcasts all the time when I commute. Um, so that is, and I think people are sort of adjusting to a new, um, new, new different, um, you know, ways of, of uh, going about their day, new routines and what they're doing. So absolutely. Um, yeah, being flexible is probably a big part of it. 
Um, okay, so going back to question three, uh, every most people said that they haven't really thought, um, or they they are looking for for the details of um, of how to record stuff. So uh, that's that's great. I hope we've given you some ideas here, um, and I know that there are other places to find uh, to find those suggestions as well. Um, Okay, we, I hope that we've actually inspired you to, to maybe look for that type of thing more. Um, so, uh, okay, so the last thing is, um, okay, so for, uh, if you are thinking about doing, uh, if you're thinking about doing a podcast, um, what, what would be your goals? What would you hope to succeed? Uh, well, for me, it would just be that there would be listenership, number one, that somebody is listening. I mean, that's sort of, if nobody's listening, then, then there's no point in doing it. So you have to have listenership. For, for me, the goal for the Evanston Public Library Checkout podcast is that we engage with our community. We give community members a voice. We uh, give voice to a diverse range of our community not just like the usual suspects. And, um, you know, that people have a good time while they're doing it. And that maybe, I think there, there might be things that will happen as a result of doing the podcast that I won't know about. But I think listenership, it, ha it has to start with listenership. If nobody's listening, it's definitely not worth doing. If you tell a story and there's nobody to hear it, you know, that's kind of sad. Yeah. It, Aaron, Aaron answered the question uh, agreeing with you saying yes and then she said I hope we could appeal to a wide audience yeah and I think there's that there's that kind of idea that you might appeal to someone who might not use the library like actually that your podcast might reach like a non-library user um, and and I, I love that idea frankly someone that you know, uh, hasn't used the library much, but hey, look, there's a podcast from our local library. Yeah, okay, Aaron is agreeing and saying, I would like to bring the library to people who don't necessarily walk in our doors. I think that's a great, I think that is a great point. Um, that's, that's awesome. Um, Donna says, I would like to have a way to engage our patrons other than an email newsletter. Uh, we don't have great open rates on emails. Okay, thank you, Donna. Yeah, I interesting way to, to kind of reach people. Uh, and, and for all the reasons that Jill has already given, I think um, there really is some opportunity there. Um, oh, I do, have, I do have one thing to say. We did make um, a sort of a quarter sheet flyer called How to Listen to a Podcast. And we put it up at all of our desks. And then it has a link to the checkout. So, you know, that's one thing that we uh, did to also promote the podcast. Yeah, educating people on the, um, on the listener side. I love that. Um, that's, that's a really cool thing to, to offer. Um, okay. Jennifer says listeners after the fact, an outlet for patrons, including kids that might want something, so want to do some type of theater thing, but might be apprehensive of doing it on a big stage education as to how things used to be done. I found myself being more flexible with how I do things after having seen slash helped with some of the old time radio programs my family did. Thanks, Jennifer. That's a really unique perspective that you've brought and I appreciate um, all the contributions here today. Um, okay, well, we, we are coming to the end. Uh, we're almost to 11 o'clock in the morning here. Um, so uh, I am going to, um, Thank Jill for, for uh, presenting today. Jill, thank you so much for all of the uh, great ideas and uh, contributions that uh, you've made here today. Um, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and, and thank you for everyone who uh, has participated in our chat. Uh, I hope you've all gotten something to take away from today. I hope maybe it will inspire you to investigate this down the line. Um, and uh, just as a reminder, the session was recorded. Um, tomorrow, you're going to be getting an email from Zoom uh, with a link to the recorded version, but you could also check it out later this afternoon on the Rails YouTube page, and we'll make it public so everyone can see it. So um, thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday.